Okay, yeah, um, don't use a Linux machine for presenting. <laughs> 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 okay, so yeah, hi, I'm Joseph. I'm actually over here at GDS. This is my, my, my office. So welcome if it's your first time here. So today I'll be talking about I'll be talking about facilitating technical discussions, which is something that I recently been trying to pick up. Okay, so a bit about me, I'm a software engineer on the MicroRES product. I hope you all know about it. So I love DevOps and most other areas of technology and its creation. So that's why I began to dabble in like public speaking to share knowledge and as well as facilitation of technical discussions. So if you want the slides, yeah, you can go to that link. Okay, so um, how it all started. So it was about one and a half years ago when we started off the MyCareers Future product. So during that time, we actually made a decision, like during our Scrum retrospectives, to include the product owners. Like retrospectives are normally done without the product owners, lah. So we decided to try give it a shot, like to see how it would improve communication. Yeah, so it worked well at the start, but then like as time grew on, like when the code base grew and the team grew as well, like it left us without a space to discuss technical issues. So then came the opportunity, which was kind of I went for a course in facilitation and how to converse. It sounds awkward, but okay, yeah. And yeah, and at the same time, we had all these technical issues being piled up. So I decided, like, why not just try and start a technical retrospective for the team? Yeah. Okay. So before I go through like how we do things, I would like to talk about some challenges and how we face, and see so that you can see like how what we do and like does it actually solve the problems? Okay. So the first problem that I noticed in technical meetings was that everyone's still on the computer. So like, I know, you mean like you walk into a room, then you see everyone still typing, and then the facilitator is like, hey guys, can I get your attention, this item, this item, like, you have been in these kind of ex experiences before, right? Yeah, so, like to me this meant like disengagement, which means that, which to me means a number of things. Like. So firstly is that people may not feel like whatever they say has value, like, oh, yeah, I say also no use, so nothing's going to change. So like it's a mode of resignation, which is, which is not optimal like, for like continuous learning. And the second reason is maybe that like if your if your team size is big, there's this thing called the bystander effect where you know like something's on everyone's mind, but everyone expects someone to say it, so in the end it never gets it. Okay, so the next issue with technical discussions, which is pretty different from business discussions, I think, is that there's always scope creep. So when you have a product of any kind of complexity, it's like you can't talk about one component without talking about another component. So when a team meets to discuss about one issue, another issue, this to another issue, this to another issue, and then like eventually lose track of everything and then like it loses focus. And those people who are not involved in the discussion, they eventually end up like being disengaged. Like they'll start typing on the computers, which goes back to the first problem. And the last point which I think is actually the most important is actually on safety. So like I mean, have you ever walked into a meeting and then like people ask people are all talking and then you just sit down there and you're like, shit, I don't know anything, what's going on? Then, like even if you have an opinion, you might not dare to say it. And I think this is both. This works for both junior and senior developers. So, like for example, myself, I'm neither junior nor senior. But like when I walk into a room and there are like fresh grads nowadays. So, what makes me feel not safe is that, like when I went into computing, like it was like straight C's we can get in, and then now the current fresh grads are all like straight A's. So to me, it's like, <laughs> you know, like yeah, you guys are so smart. <laughs> Should I say anything? Yeah, but I guess as junior developers, it's also like the, the tech industry is very, very hyped up, very scary. So it's like, I suppose you might feel like the imposter syndrome or like you don't really feel like you fit in. Yeah, so one of the considerations was how do we make people feel safe? Okay, so I'll run through like a short overview of how we do things, of how we facilitate this technical discussion that we call technical retrospective. So some guiding principles by developers for developers. So like, Having a scrum master there, like you know, scrum masters are like you know, sometimes they're on your side, sometimes they are like, no, you have to deliver. Yeah. So we because this was a place for us to resolve technical issues, we decided to make it like a for developers by developers thing. So basically it's the room will be all technical people, no POs, no BAs. Yeah, and second objective is to nurture a safe space for engineering excellence. Because like I mean if you want to show a product, you want one year and then just leave it and you can for, you can forego engineering excellence. Nothing nothing's bad nothing bad is gonna happen. And the last one is appreciate the unforgiving minute. So this is more for, for focus. Because like, if you let a discussion go on endlessly, like, people tend to get disengaged, people like, start typing on the computers, because only those people involved in that topic will be interested in it. Yeah. So 
the first section is actually grounding, which is where we establish intentions and premise. So this section is where like once everyone is there, then we'll read out a set of ground rules. So I will try to show it to you, but yeah, it's Linux. Hold on. Okay, yeah. Again, I, I think I'll just go through everything on, the, on this board. So okay, so this is our actual te technical retrospective board. So firstly, we will read out the ground rules once everyone is present. So only for technical development team members, so which goes along with for developers by developers. So the part on safety, this comes in three points because I, I can't I you don't really know how to put it into a single point. So first is what's said here or done here stays here. So feel free to raise disagreements. Because disagreements is when change can happen. Second is no offense. We are all here to make the team happier and more productive. Because like I'm sure like as agents especially, we are all afraid to offend someone. Like I'm in a meeting, like I want to say something bad, but I don't really know how to put it objectively across. And even if I know how to put it across objectively, I don't know how you'll take it. Yeah, it's a it's an Asian thing, I guess. Like we don't get that from Caucasians. So next is keep boundaries to observation, assessment, and action. So I think this is something that has been quite effective in getting actual issues raised. So like observation is how you saw it, assessments are how you perceived it. So like just because something happened doesn't mean it's bad. It may be good to some people, it may be bad to some people. And the last one is actions, what can be done about it. So when you combine all these three together, it, it creates an issue where there is more value. Like, like you know whether it's coming from a personal background or is it coming from an objective background. Yeah. And the last is the time box. So the, we use the time box to actually improve engagement. So like when you know a topic is gonna end in five minutes, for example, you know that everything has to be said within here and then we'll move on. And the whole retrospective is actually conducted in one hour, in a strict one hour time box. So when that happens, right, like to developers, it's like, okay, I just need to put my, my work aside for one hour. It's not gonna last for more than that. I will get to code again after this. Yeah, so it helps to elevate. Okay. Uh, okay, so next will be follow ups. So follow ups are kind of they kind of embody like actionable continuity and it gives weight to the issues and the sharing space because I mean like if I raise an issue and nothing gets done about it then like for what? Yeah. So when we do follow ups, one way that we try to and try to make it safe for developers to raise issues is no deadlines. So we have an emphasis on progress instead of deadlines because like as engineers, I'm, I'm quite sure most of you will understand that a lot of things can't be a, a strict deadline. I mean like you may encounter a problem, you may solve that problem and then another problem comes up. Yeah, so our emphasis there to make it safe for people is no deadlines. And okay, I won't go through this, it's quite simple. And sharings. So the next section will be actually on sharings. Because we focus a lot on continuous improvement. Like if you read the Phoenix project by Gene Kim, like one of the ideal ways or not one of the, the third way of DevOps, or rather on any agile team like, should be to dedicate like twenty percent of your time to continuously improve the process of how code goes from development into production. So during this session, there is basically no time limits involved, and it looks something like this. Yeah, don't use Linux. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so those labeled in green are actually our tech sharings. So you can see like integration tests, knowledge repo. So these are all sharings that our team members will actually raise things that they think may be good for the project, for the product, and then like, if everyone agrees to it, then we will either implement it or we can see how we can make progress towards an ideal state. Yep, and the last one is actually issues. So if I'm finding a non-green one. Okay, so like for example, all these, these are actually issues which have been voted upon. So the last part is on, the last part is issues, and issues are things like, that deal with like improvement of the code base, or like things that you want to raise like that, for example. So we keep this in a five minute time box and to keep things focused, we aim to start conversations, not end them. Because like if you start one conversation, like you know it can go on and on and on scope creep and stuff. Yep. So some other things that we do is like a fixed time frame for the retrospective, so like one hour. Like you know, just put aside your work aside for one hour, it'll be fine. And we usually conduct it at the end of the work day and work week, which is like Friday, about 4 30 pm. Yep. So you know we kind of intentionally break your train of thought so that you can go home and rest because like if you keep working like you will burn out eventually. Okay, so this is the last section, things to take note of. So some things that I learned while attempting to facilitate it is okay, so the first is actually emotions. This is a this is inside out. I'm not sure how many of you have watched it, but it's a really great show. So the thing to note is that decisions are always emotional. When you decide to do something, like try to recall the last time you decided to decided to do something. Was it purely logical? I, for me, it isn't. Uh. 
like there's always an emotion like I want to do this I'm driven to do this I'm motivated to do this that's why I actually did it so secondly is body language so one thing that I notice is that if you want to figure out who feels like sharing who doesn't feel like sharing and if they need to speak up because it's for example the area of expertise the body never lies so if you go if you go into somewhere and you see someone like maybe like hunched over like that then they are like quiet most of the time then you know like you should try to encourage them to speak or find out at least what's happening in their lives like maybe there's something going on which the team doesn't know about yeah and the last one is verbal verbal language so I found it useful I actually learned it from a workshop right? so the facilitator recommended in order to facilitate powerful conversations like we can actually break down most of our conversations into five heuristics so first facts facts that are acceptable so like for example this stand over here has three dicks like I'm, I'm quite sure no one will dispute that right and then assessments I think three dicks is bad for balance for example but some other people may have a different opinion so those are assessments offers are things like if let's say I say three dicks are bad and then like for example, like maybe you for example, you, you'll be saying something like, yeah, three dicks are bad. So that's an offer. So I'm offering something to the conversation, but I'm not giving any kind of resolution to it. Next is request. So requests are questions. So let, let's say for example, like after the whole conversation happened, then I say, so what's your opinion of, of three-legged stands? Yeah, so that's kind of like a request, which is like I am trying to seek an opinion. But all of this will actually lead to a meaningless conversation if there is no declarations. So declarations is like, yes, this thing is good, everyone chips in and say, yes, we will buy a three-legged tripod, for example. So that's when things actually happen lah, in the discussion. So like in the software development world, it may be things like, okay, we object-oriented programming is good. But some people will say, no, functional programming is good. But if it goes on like this forever, it's all between facts, assessments, offers, requests. So like what makes the actual, what makes the discussion work out is the declarations. So when you're, facilitating a when you're facilitating a technical discussion, it's useful to help to drive the conversation towards a declaration. Okay, so the last part is on some interesting resources that I thought might be good if you all are interested in it. So first is actually Emotional Agility by Susan David. So in order to understand others' emotion, you have to understand yourself first. So she actually goes through this quite in detail about how we can use our emotions to make our lives better. So second is How to Win Friends and Influence People, which is actually quite a cunning book to be honest, but it, it helps in teaching you how to build rapport and how to make friends with people. And the last one, the workshop that I was talking about earlier, is actually by the Top Collective, which is a Singapore social enterprise. So they have this course called Facilitating, Facilitating Powerful Conversations, which is actually where my whole journey started. Like, I actually wanted to try the techniques that worked for me, see, like, see whether it would work for me in, in a tech setting. Yeah, so that is the end of my presentation. Thank you.